Hello, everyone. Welcome to another book discussion between the Unerased Book Club and Ann Arbor District Library. Tonight, we are discussing The Duke Who Didn't by Courtney Milan. This is um, a romance. It's very exciting. Uh, before we get started, maybe we could quickly do an introduction and a brief visual description. If you're comfortable with that, I can start. My name is Lucy. I am a library tech in the youth department at the library, but I do a lot of adult programming as well. And um, I love doing these book discussions. I'm a 52 year old white woman with glasses and shoulder length brown hair, I'm wearing a red shirt and sitting in front of some books and um, some artwork. Hello, I am Anne. And I'm a book pro, primarily stationed at Westgate currently. Um, I am a 46-year-old white woman, heavy set with long uh, brown hair just below my shoulders with glasses. And I'm sitting in front of a white wall with a shelf up above me. Hi, everyone. I'm Fatima Hawk. I am one of the co-facilitators for the Unerased Book Club. I am a South Asian woman um, in her mid-30s, and I am wearing a pink and white striped shirt, and my black hair is pulled back in a bun because it is too hot outside. Um, and uh, I have a digital background of uh, the Chittagong skyline from, from a balcony. And hi, everyone. I'm Sheila. I'm the founder of the Unraced Book Club and other co-facilitator. Um, I am wearing glasses. I'm uh, brought a South Asian American woman in my early 30s um, with my hair also pulled up like Fatima's. And I'm wearing a cardigan. And behind me is a blurred wall. Um, and I'm really excited that we're getting a chance to have an intimate conversation about The Duke Who Didn't. It's a romance novel set in a revisionist history a la Bridgerton, but published before Bridgerton, uh, or around the same time, where there's more of a conversation of race, ethnicity, and class within um, the idea of Victorian England. Um, so I'm going to open it up. What did people think about this romance book for July? Um, I I loved it. I had a little trouble when I started reading it. I wasn't sure like what the tone was. And then I started listening to it. I don't know if anyone else listened to the audio, but the narrator is so excellent. I mean, one of the best first people I've heard narrate a book. She just really brings so much life to it. And I started to realize how funny it was and just how um, I got so pulled into the story. And then I went back to reading it. So I kind of did a combination of both. Um, and I just, I loved it. I loved the characters. I loved the humor. I thought it was great to read a romance that also kind of um, got into some other, you know, things like you were saying, Sheila, you know, like race and uh, culture and socioeconomics and class. Um, and then I also learned, I mean, I, I had to actually look things up while I was reading this book, certain historical things that are actually real that are in the book. Um, so I learned a lot too, but I I was so pleasantly surprised by this and I, I really just enjoyed it so much. I also had a little bit of a hard time getting going with it. Um, I think partially because initially it struck me as uh, one of those historical romances where it's historical in name only um like initially it felt like the only thing that was making it historical was calling a clipboard a board clip um but once it got going uh it really did engage some of those like what part of this is historical and what part of it is kind of a recreation of a world that didn't quite exist um but i really enjoyed the twist that that provided to the kind of generic romance tropes that were also in there. Um, I will say that as is not unusual with romances, I was kind of yelling at the characters, like, why don't you just talk to each other? <laughs> but you wouldn't have very many romance books if it was just a simple matter of um, talking about things at the very beginning of the book. But uh, yeah, I also really 
enjoyed it. I looked forward to going back and um, not going back, but continuing to read it um, between sessions. So yeah, I liked it. I also really enjoyed it to the point where I was like, oh, I need to go look at her other books because I was uh, impressed with the depth of characters in, um, and then also some of the themes that they were playing around with. So there were themes around race and adjustments and, um, you know, uh, dreams and agency and all of that. And I, I really, I thought it was really well done. Um, and, uh, I, it was a fun, fun book to read. So I'm glad that we're discussing it. Yeah. I also just want to say, I was so happy that the book cover featured real people instead of the drawing the theme that we have been trend that we've been on with book covers, um, the cartoon drawing. So it was actually nice to read a romance novel with a somewhat steamy co cover with actual models. To that point, I was actually, it took me a while to reconcile the way the book was written or like the the type of romance book it was with the cover. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually received this as a recommendation from one of our regular readers, um, Cynthia Krishnan, who's an Ann Arbor resident, and she's a real big fan of romance. And so um, I don't know, Fathom, if you read it before we selected it this for this year, but I didn't. And I was like, well, We'll see how this turns out for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I I thought it was going to be, there were going to be a lot more um, explicit scenes. I thought it was going to be more heavy on the physical intimacy, not the emotional or um, mental intimacy between them. And that, that disparity, I think, between a slightly steamy cover and the slow burn of the book, um, I don't think it like put me off. It was just, it made me, feel like I was maybe missing something or was it going to like crescendo and have like a lot more at the end but thinking about the way it was constructed I really appreciated that Milan took her time in introducing the characters introducing how they know each other the con like the this once a year event that brings them together and creates that uh spark yet friction between the two like Anne was saying yeah they could just talk to each other but there's a reason that this book focuses like has this uh plot device of an annual fair that brings uh one of the protagonists to town um and it's that like before phones existed so they can't actually talk to each other and they have to like figure out their feelings that are otherwise time bound over a period of 10 years I, I did enjoy it much more than I think I initially assumed. Like it, it's a it's a book that took me a while to appreciate. So at the uh, center, Liz, oh, oh, go ahead. You go ahead, please. Oh, at the center of the story, there's like this sauce and the competition around it. Um, what were your thoughts or take on that? Um, and since it was such a huge part of the book, um, what did you think about the amount of space that it was dedicated to this plot line? Um, well, I appreciated the, the author's note at the end where she sort of explains about um, like the real origin of, you know, like Worcestershire sauce. And, and um, I think it, was interesting to have it in here because it like this whole idea was based on this kind of appropriation you know these people took this thing these white people took these things from these uh chinese man and it was um the type of thing that was really gonna help chloe and her dad you know sort of live their life but also i enjoyed it because chloe was so central to the the sauce actually being successful and she had a big role in it and even though she had so much trouble naming it um you know i think the fact that she it, it was as a woman it was just as much hers to kind of like take charge of and to run and then ultimately she has this duke 
who is helping her in sort of a, a serving role and the way he jumps in. So I think it was like a really interesting vehicle for that kind of like switching of their relationship. Um, and it also, we got to see her and how she, you know, takes charge of something and, um, and also like this, it, it even seems relevant today. I mean, I think people, look at certain cuisine from certain cultures and they they assume a certain thing about it because of where it comes from and so like whether or not you give this sauce the right name and give people tell people what it really is or make them like it because they don't know that it you know that it's foreign um so there was like a lot going on with just this one little sauce mm -hmm. i enjoyed just the um inclusion of the foodie aspect um just as something that I personally like reading about but I was invested in kind of that whole cultural appropriation thing with the the two Englishmen that basically stole the recipe of the original sauce that um Chloe's father had created but I like the notion that sorry I've got a gnat flying around um I like the the notion of they may have stolen a sauce but they didn't steal the best sauce like that was still to be made mm -hmm. um I wish that there hadn't been as much emphasis on revenge though it felt like there was it felt like it was holding the characters back, like move, move past this emotionally because you're putting too much of your self in anger. Um, whereas just focusing on creating this amazing sauce seemed like it would have been enough uh, motivation. Yeah. But we, I guess the question is, do you think the desire for revenge is warranted? I think it's warranted. I just don't know if it was healthy. That's fair. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think some of it too was born of Chloe, you know, like Chloe's father didn't seem as as um driven towards revenge as she did. And so I think some of it came from that promise that she made her mother that she wouldn't um, you know, she wouldn't leave her father and she would support him. So it really seemed to be her thing way more than his, even though he was the one whose sauce it was originally. I also think that there's something about an elder generation being so worn down and beaten by, you know, microaggressions and racism. I'm sure that wasn't the only instance that he's experienced. And, and as a result, like the desire to fight can diminish, um, and so Chloe kind of took that up for her dad in a way. I feel like it also made sense for Chloe to be more fixated on this. And her character had much more hyperfixation, like tendencies, like needing a clipboard, needing to like focus on these different tasks. Um, and very much like the byproduct of living in a society where you're you're just not valued for who you are. She had to prove her worth over and over and over again. Um, uh, and it kind of comes across as like, maybe her dad was like, fine, just doing this on his own. He's not trying to like necessarily commercialize a hobby. But for her, it like shows that her family does have worth if it can get through all of the traditional channels of being seen as valuable or having worth to society. And that is such a, I think that is such a, such a natural instinct for a lot of us, right? Um, I've been recently having a lot of conversations with other writer friends who, um, you know, and we've been talking about the 
between self-publishing versus being published by, you know, um, the traditional publishers. And a lot of us are just like, at the end of the day, we want self-publishing seems easier, but we would want the recognition of being published um, by traditional publishers and that, rec and that recognition carries a lot of weight um, in so many ways, even when we see that certain authors can get burned by that or otherwise. And so this desire to be recognized by institutions that we've been told are the authority on something is very, very natural. Uh, Lucy, you mentioned that you um, looked up other historical princes. What else in the book besides the sauce? Or was that what uh, you were mainly thinking of? Well, also there was the, they reference this and she talks about it, I think in her afterward, like just the, um, well, I was interested like in the languages that they're using and how um, that's complicated within like, you know, three people can be standing together and between the three of them, they have to find one way that they can communicate because they're all kind of bringing a different language to it. Um, and so I did look up a little bit like the, the, you know, the difference between the Hakka and that Cantonese. And I think she talks about that in, in her author's note. But then there was also that um, rebellion or uprising that is like very briefly referenced, I think, in the beginning of the book. And then the... Um, it was just really interesting to learn about and to realize like how huge it was in history, how many lives were lost compared to like the U.S. Civil War. Um, but yet it's something I feel like nobody knows about or learns about. So um, it, I just think it's I, I haven't read a lot of romance novels like this, you know, um, that have me compelled to keep, to like really dive deeper into subjects that are brought up in them. Um, that are really important to the story here, but also like expanded my learning as well. So those were um, some of the things. And I think because she started to address them in the author's note, and I was like, oh, I want to know more about that. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find the, oh, the Taiping Tianguo, I think is like this uprising, uh, this huge civil war where like millions of people were killed. Um, but that the before that happened, women got a lot of agency in that society, and that's where she got the idea for like creating someone um like Chloe's actual mother had like a role in, you know, um like an important role in society. I think women were actually given jobs and they were given property in real life. So there was a lot um there was a lot that came up in the book a little bit, but that if I dug deeper, I found was based in some pretty interesting history. Yeah. And I think that's a feature of like a lot of Courtney Milan's work. Um, I started reading her newsletter and they're also like super well-researched. Um, she is a lawyer or a former lawyer. Um, so she, I guess this is her jam, like just going into the weeds about things and um and making those connections. So her newsletter is excellent, I've come to realize. So would recommend. Um, and she does get into details about the most random things, which is really nice and has great tea recommendations. Yeah, I was also interested to learn about her when I was looking things up, but like, this is not, this is her uh, pen name and that she was this like clerk for, you know, um, Supreme Court Justice, Sandra Day O'Connor. And then the other, she was involved in the Me Too movement, like a really big part in that, a uh, really big part in the Romance Writers Association sort of breaking apart. Um, so she just, and she went to U of M Law School. So she- mm -hmm. There was, you know, there was a lot there. Um, she seems like a really interesting, like, like person who's had this really kind of um, a lot 
besides just being a romance writer, that's really different from being what you would think of as being a romance writer and has kind of sort of popped up in these instrumental places in recent, you know, um, historical and cultural phenomenon. So it was really interesting. I found um, the part of her Wikipedia biography discussing her parents a little bit weird. I don't know if you guys read that, but it when it talks about her dad, it goes in on his accomplishments and this and that. And then, so she was born to this guy and a Chinese mother. And that's literally the only thing that is said about her mother, um, which just felt not great. Yeah. I wonder who edited that. <laughs> I think her, uh, it, you know, involvement um in in trying for a lot of changes and things because the, with the especially with the romance writers association like she a lot of it just got blamed on her even though that that was not the case she's pulling out a very systemic issue of romance writers being like focusing mainly on white characters and white writers and uh, the lack of diversity um in general and how hard it is in that publishing space, among many other things. So I'm um, just, yeah. Like, how can you blame a systemic thing on an individual because she called it out? Yeah. Now I am reading her Wikipedia page. And something that's really interesting, especially for you, Fatima, is that uh, Milan self-publishes. Oh. Um, and in the Wikipedia article, it says uh, she wanted to increase control over how her books were designed and marketed. Mm -hmm. um, and she does hire professional editors and, and does contract out design cover. But that's super cool that with her, like her reputation and the amount of clout she probably has, she still chooses to to focus on the execution of her book. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. I really liked the um, creation of, and I was hoping that it was somehow a real thing, but it's not, of this, you know, village or town that's about 50% Chinese in England. Mm. And the kind of just almost seamless integration of the communities within that village with still there's this the the whole of England still is kind of oppressive in some ways well in a lot of ways but especially with Jeremy and um so Jeremy's the duke and he is uh half Chinese and half um white English Anglo-Saxon um and the way his aunt is putting pressure on him to find a nice English woman to marry um, in order to keep kind of the dukedom in white hands. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciated the kind of different society expectations that we were seeing within the localized community and the whole country yeah I really liked um the backstory to the duke and um he, his story having its own agency to feel flushed out and um like the explanation of the stress he felt at school in society by his own paternal side of his family's like wishes um and how they want him to uphold what the duke title is in a traditional sense and at the same time uh constantly like sideline him and his ideas because of his maternal line 
and what he looks like physically. Yeah, and that's like, they're, I mean, his aunt's asking basically for this kind of erasure of, you know, any of his Chinese half. And like, so ultimately it's, it's kind of an assimilation through his line. Like, you know, if you marry an English woman, then your children will be less Chinese and then their children will be less Chinese. And pretty soon, you know, um, there won't be any Chinese and how, like you're saying, Sheila, how he had this resistance to like everything that she was asking him to do. But then I also love the way that he um, sort of was going to play her at her own game by being like, you know, I'll create something that, you know, I'll make this list that would be something that you would never actually agree to. Um, and I also just found it, I was charmed by his whole like creation of this list where it was just everything that Chloe was doing um, <laughs> and she just wasn't getting it. But uh, yeah, I thought, I thought he was a really um, likable character with a, a really good backstory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, what did you all think of the romance and also um, some of the steamy scenes in the book? Um, so normally when I read romance, which isn't very often, it's like, pretty predictable that it's like tension, ex uh, very explicit physical scenes, then back to tension of some sorts, build up, and then you do it again, maybe repeat two or three times. I really like that that wasn't the case here. It was like one time, it was very mellow. Um, and then they like went back to the actual reality of their lives and the conflict inherent in their relationship or in their personal lives and how that Im influences the way they interact with each other. Um, and I think, like I said earlier, the intimacy that is expressed like emotionally and mentally between the two is pretty gripping as well. Um, not in like a thriller way, but like you feel for them. You're like, okay, well, let's hope, let's see how you resolve this by the end of the book. That's so, what kept oh. me reading. Sorry. Oh. That's actually what kept me reading because um, I have a tendency of not finishing romance novels because they become predictable or they feel predictable. And so then I just like uh, I give up. But um, but this one, it did keep me reading till the end. Well, part of it is it felt like the the romance parts of it were important but they were kind of a backdrop um in the sense that like the the whole sauce thing and um for chloe and jeremy just kind of dealing with not really wanting to be a duke and how to you know he thinks he's hiding this this from everybody in the community so he's trying to just be as useful and down to earth as possible mm -hmm. and I feel like those things kind of balanced out or, or it made it I guess let me try again um the uh the fact that he was more interested in her and her desires and her wants and goals versus just hey she's pretty and we've been thrown together so I guess we're falling in love now um I really liked that there was more depth to their relationship and um I appreciated that we got a little bit of love early on like sexy scenes but not sexy um well sexy not sex um scenes early to midway through the book and then it just kind of got set aside until it was appropriate for it to come back in again instead it just instead of it just becoming a lust story yeah 
Yeah. I think when it did come back in to um, one of the things I liked about that was that it, I mean, it still used like a lot of the, the kind of words that you read in romance novels when people are actually like physically getting together, um, you know, like kind of euphemism type words, but it also, um, I think it was like realistic in a way that Chloe was first of all, like pursuing something that she wanted in this physical interaction between them to the point where it was like, no, that actually doesn't work. And, um, you know, like what you're doing right now, mm, try something different. And, um, I just like, I appreciated that, I guess, because I think there are a lot of romance novels where like when they actually are intimate together, it's just like this perfect thing that has zero awkwardness and and so I just like I thought there was like some humanity and you know like these are actually people and this might actually happen um so I liked that about it I thought that um you know it was it was nice to read something where you know like they actually had seemed like real people it was nice and also awkward <laughs> yeah that's what I mean like that's I what I mean it was like yeah. which is like that's way more real than you yeah. know a lot of what you read and you're like that how could that happen in that place like that you know so yes. um I appreciated that so that's Lucy nice. you had oh. mentioned earlier that the recording is very humorous like did that come through in the yeah okay yeah yeah the whole the whole time she just I I don't know how to describe it. Like there are great audiobook narrators, I think, but she just like, I don't know. She just had the the right nuance in the right places. And um, she really brought a different life to it. So if, you know, I don't know what else she narrates if she narrates the second part of this, but um, she would be a narrator worth looking out for if you like audiobooks. Yeah. Mary Jane Wells. Mm-hmm. Um, I was saying uh, before Fatima asked about the narrator. Um, okay. Oh yeah. So most romance books really feel like they're an escapist, um, like escapist genre. Like a lot of people's personal lives may not feel like they have that spice because like day-to-day -day life kind of can wear you down. But this feels like an escape from the escapism within the same genre um, of like, romance doesn't always have to be this way so it's like interesting because I feel yeah when you are reading like the, it's very popular to read quote-unquote smut um and is what I haven't read any like sociological papers or articles reflecting on why it's so popular um and I'm curious if it is because a lot of people feel like that's missing in their lives because of the grind of everything else um and so what does it mean for a book like this to be positioned in that context? And I do want to say that Ferndale in Metro Detroit is getting its first, well, we're getting our first romance bookstore, Oh, which is why it's like jumping on this huge trend of there's like 30 different romance uh, specific bookshops in the country now. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is one of them. And it's going to be in Ferndale. Wow. Yeah. When does it open? I think this month. Yeah. Just in time for a steamy July. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. I like that. I think, you know, romance has changed so much and it's become so much more expansive. And um, I think it's good to, that there are like stores that are selling it because I think a lot of people don't realize that. And so they just look at romance novels in this um, disdainful way. And there's kind of, you know, I just... Um, I think it's a genre that can include a lot more than people realize. So I, I like to know that it's like people, there's such a demand for it that an entire store can exist and, and also be a store where you could go in and probably find a huge variety of things to read. So that's exciting. I went to a nerd night talk once that talked about all the subgenres within the romance genre, and it was uh, wild. Like, you know, you have your basics of your traditional romance and your historical romance and 
you know, your paranormal romance, but then you also have your like, um, you know, your half human, half God, half animal, whatever romance. And there, there's just so many offshoots and variations. I was just, I was shocked. What did you all think about the father's plot line? Well, like, I was I wasn't thinking about his plot line specifically, but I was about to jump in and say that I really loved their relationship. Um it just it's another thing that you don't necessarily see in romance novels, but this just really caring um relationship between father and daughter um i i found the kind of twist in his story to be abrupt maybe if i went back and reread there would be kind of more hints going through um but I I liked his story and I loved their relationship. Hmm. Yeah, I thought that he, the twist about his relationship to Chloe um, felt a little unnecessary, but maybe it's like to mirror that... Uh, the twist of him knowing who Jeremy really is. Mm. It's like we all have we all have different ways of expressing our relationships to people. And while he puts the pressure on Jeremy to be more transparent, he didn't feel the need to be more transparent himself until pushed into a corner. Mm. And think about that like that. That's pretty um yeah, that's interesting one thing i do i thought was um like i liked about the twist is that chloe felt like she knew nothing about um like her father or you know her mother and she never learned anything about the person who she was living with who was her father like his growing up his history and then when this twist happens she's like oh wait i have been hearing about you all along you were just the little brother um so I do like for her that she was able to then like know some things about him yeah but it is it, it was kind of now that you're saying it Sheila like that he was keeping this hidden but yet being so adamant with Jeremy about not hiding who you are so We going haven't talked back about to, one of the major plot. Sorry, go ahead. I was just say gonna say that um, going back to the the sauce and um, her father, uh, him talking with, I think it was talking to Jeremy about um, how the sauce that he was making was pretty much as English as they come mm -hmm. because of the um now i can't even think it is it the molds or whatever in the air that it, he's fermenting with only exists where he is mm -hmm. um so the sauce couldn't get created in the same way anywhere else uh, which i just found to be a really interesting perspective with it And kind of the claiming of Englishness, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I live here and I'm English, 
I'm also Chinese, but I'm English. I'm not, I'm not forever a migrant, mm -hmm. basically. Honestly, when I was reading this, I completely forgot that that's how fermentation works. It like uses the air that you are in. You can't, re you can't replicate it easily. That's why like tapache is a very Mexican drink. It's like you need to ferment using those, the air and that type of pineapple. Um, or like sourdough tastes different from place to place. Like San Francisco sourdough tastes, it has a very specific taste compared to like sourdough done in Michigan. Um, and while like, if you do fermentation stuff, you know this, to see it casually talked about in a romance novel is just not what I was expecting. Yeah. And I think that goes back to the ways that romance writers have really like, taken on bigger topics and tackled really important things i'm thinking i'm forgetting the title but the romans that i read last year which about the football players and head trauma and just being like so that's the right the right I swipe know. yeah the right swipe was that the one yeah yeah and so like these are not things that i would think about honestly but here yeah so lots of depth, which is great. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts or anything that you want to share that you are not able to share about this book? Yeah, I we didn't even talk about the event or the the affair that happens that brings all of them together. The Wedgeford trials. Yeah. Like, what an interesting piece of lore to have to build out, again, in a romance novel that you're not going to have to revisit again. I mean, I'm assuming. Um, maybe in the sequel, they, it's the same context. But like, that's a lot of work mm -hmm. to get people, like your reader, to feel invested in what is essentially the backdrop to a, a narrative. Um, but like, yeah, it's lore. It's world building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she and you know in the author's note again, she talks about like the the genesis for the idea coming from this um real town that had this like ages old kind of event. Which I want to. There was a um documentary called Wild in the Streets that which I really want to find and watch about this small town in England that has this like yearly thing that brings other people there. But yeah, then to take it to just to take that small idea, like you're saying, Sheila, and just create it in a different way, create the whole town, um, the the real tokens and the fake tokens and the the way the game is played and the way the teams are created and the way that you get your nickname and you come to town and and even having like characters in there, like the, the I can't remember his name, but the new kid who's coming, who Jeremy is kind of like his teacher, like that doesn't need to be in the story to tell chloe and jeremy's story but it is it is building that world and it's giving jeremy's story another like layer of depth so um yeah I, you know it's it it was pretty central to like the whole th it kind of ran throughout the whole story in in some ex like in expansive ways it kind of you know it also gave more opportunities for humor to come in And she has, uh, so the world building is not for naught, but it. she has two other books in this series, um, one that's already out and one that's coming out at the end of this month. So, yeah. Have you read the one that's already out? Have you read the um, second one? I'm still on the Libby way list, so we will see. <laughs> but I would like to, yes. I was like, check it out, yeah. Because this is very enjoyable. Yeah, I I would say once again, I mean, you two did a wonderful job picking a book that <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I mean, I do enjoy romance, especially. I love the way that the genre has expanded as we've been talking about. But I I don't think this, that I would have come across this or picked it up, and I just so thoroughly enjoyed it. And I found it an audiobook narrator that I want to um 
pursue as well. So she thank you. Looks like she narrates a lot of romance. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. including some classics like Persuasion. Oh, that yeah. would be okay. <laughs> yes. And hopefully everybody goes to this grand opening of the romance bookstore. Um it's scheduled for Saturday, August 3rd. The bookstore is called Love and Other Books in Ferndale, which I'm really excited about now. I'm like, I need to go see it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I can't remember when this will be released, but we are meeting in person. I guess you're good, but never mind. It's a Saturday. Um, yeah. I don't think this will be up in time. Uh, the 20th at 27 Flutter Books, which is the only Asian American bookstore, owned bookstore in Metro Detroit. Um, so we're going to be talking about the Duke who didn't there. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to talk about books with you all again. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It, it's they're just always great discussions and fun books or interesting books or new books. So, yeah. yeah. And next week, or sorry, next month, we are reading Physics of the Impossible. There we go. There we go. Yukaku. Yeah. Um, trying this is to get first, like, of, yeah. Yeah. So, our first, like, kind of STEM focused book. So, I'm really excited. Yes. It's it's the opposite of this one. It's quite a <laughs> it's quite a pivot. It is. Yeah. Well, we figure you know the theme is like you're getting back into school stuff. Get your brain mm -hmm. ready to go learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Thank you guys so much, and to the viewers, thank you, thank you for tuning in. Yeah. Thank you.